Welcome, it's great to have you with us and we look forward to you joining us throughout the Wellbeing Conversation, which is also a collection of stories, a lot of stories. Our aim to share stories from experts, well-known individuals and ANZ people. And it's all about presenting unique, inspiring and practical insights to help you navigate through this challenging period. Now this is part B of our chapter, conversation around flexible working and the new normal. So let's reintroduce our panellists, recurring panellist Dylan Alcott. Dill, let's keep going. This has been fun. Let's keep going, brother. I'm loving it. Learning a lot myself. Georgia Merch, great to have you with us. Well, we're just continuing the conversation. There's a lot more to get through. There will be, certainly with Dom and I on the call. <laughs> and Dom Price from Atlassian. You're good company, Dom. Can I say that? Oh, you can. I, I tell you what, I'm ready to spice this up. All right, well, let's get ready to spice it up. Here we go. Now, we didn't include this tidbit of information in the first chapter of this particular theme, being flexible working and the new normal. We thought we'd save it for the second chapter. Dom, uh, you have, well, it's not so much a revelation, but is it true that a couple of TV shows played a role in you ending up on our shores? Yeah, it was uh, 2003. I was busy working and drinking my way through London. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to travel and work in Australia, and I was inspired by Home and Away and Neighbours. I was convinced that I'd either be living in Summer Bay or I could just walk into neighbours' houses and, and share tea. And, and sadly, police and HR have had to be involved in my time in Australia. Uh, those TV shows are not true. They are not documentaries. They're, they're <laughs> hey, Dom, do you want to know that I was actually on Neighbours? Really? I'm pretty yeah. jealous. Dylan so, trumps you. Do you, know, do you know Chris Hemsworth, brother Liam Hemsworth? He was yeah. on Neighbours and he was a surfer and he had a surfy accident and ended up in a wheelchair and he wanted to win the girl over. So he challenged the girl's boyfriend to a match of wheelchair basketball. So I was his like mentor coach on the show. So that pretty yeah. much makes me a Hemsworth brother, doesn't it? Mate, you, I tell you what, you might be missing Wimbledon, but you've got other stuff to be celebrating. You are all right. Okay. I'll take that. Wow. You guys are so famous. I feel like it's really important to share that I was a Heinz baby. Oh, So, nice. yeah. Mic drop moment from Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Beat, beat us all. Brad, what about you? You have been on TV? Uh, a while back. <laughs> um, we've had a fantastic first part of our conversation around flexibility and the new normal. Dom, you've had many instances of really valuable people within Atlassian whose circumstances changed and it meant that they moved either to the edge of the city or to the other side of the world. But with some smart thinking and adapting, you make it work. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't happen by accident. I, I think there's a phase where you can be lucky with it and you feel like it's just natural and it's not. There's, as we've talked before, there's so many social aspects and so much osmosis to being in the same co-working space with each other. And so you have to be very purposeful with how do you build and maintain relationships, how do you build connections, but also realize that so much of our work can be done asynchronous. So much of our work, our tasks can be done without other people, but it's when we come together as teams that we want to be purposeful about how we collaborate. And, and we believe that we can do that online a, a huge amount, but where we can't, where we have that complex gnarly problem or, or something we've never done before, we're quite happy pre-COVID to put people on a plane and, and, and get them in the room together so that they can have that rich tapestry of conversation. But that's the exception, right? What it means is, is that in their normal day-to-day -day business, they can design their own week and, and get the flexibility that Dylan talks about. You know, if, if you have someone that needs care or access to something at a different time, the construct of nine to five, Monday to Friday, precludes them from work and that's not cool, right? They've got an amazing brain and amazing heart. Why are we, why are we excluding them from, from from yeah, this rich sort of uh, idea of, of, of collaboration and respectful dissent and diversity of thoughts, we need those people in that conversation. So we've, we've enabled ourselves to do that. We were doing it in a, in a kind of drip feed way by selection, uh, challenging people to think about how it worked for them. Um, and, then, and then we just put a huge amount of accelerant on that in February when COVID happened, right? And it just became, you know, we went from kind of whatever percent, our third biggest office to our only office is now work from home. Yeah, wow, that really is amazing. To everyone here, because we are sharing bits and pieces of, of ourselves, has anyone found out something that has really surprised them uh, in regards to who they thought they were? Uh, I think the, the biggest thing that I've 
learned throughout this is, um, I guess, the ability to find the, the positives in, in the situation that we're in. And um, I was somebody that was constantly busy. I had about seven jobs on the go and I was never home and things like that. And by being forced to be home and being you know, able to see my partner a lot more and, and connect you know, with my family, even though not directly in contact, I just can't even begin to tell you how much I've loved that. You know what I mean? And it was something that I probably wouldn't have done previously. Um, I would have just kept going at 100 miles an hour. And by able to take a step back and, and actually, you know, calm down a little bit, I've actually enjoyed my life probably a bit more than I thought I would have, which has been a great learning from my point of view. And, and the other thing is just how much of a benefit it can be, as Dom said, to be able to, you know, work from home and, and to be able to set your own schedule. Um, I know from, from my community, obviously, me having a disability, there are four point five million Australians with a disability, huge number, yeah, one in five people. Only fifty three percent of them can can find a job. Um, unemployment is double for people with a disability compared to able bodied people. Yet they're some of the smartest people you've ever met, equally as productive. Um, all they need is a bit of understanding around the best ways for them to operate and and our our workplaces and our organizations should be a snapshot of our community. Shouldn't they not? Because our clients are everybody. They're everybody, all kinds of different people. Yet for so long, I think a huge majority of our population have been left out of the working pool because they haven't understood the ability um, of how to get these people involved. So hopefully I think these learnings can, can really inject, I guess, a different mindset into our organizations, but also promote diversity within there that can really help, I guess, our society as a whole. I love what you're saying, Dylan, because it, it's also throwing a rock to people's perceptions of I can't. And in COVID, where we've all had to go remote, and Dom, you touched on this before, you know, I can't let my workforce all go remote because I don't trust them. Or what, you know, whatever it may be, or we can't afford it, or we need people to be together in order to create a culture. And these were all the misnomers that we had around how we're supposed to do work and life moving forward. And one of the things that I've been surprised about, Brad, is the connection that can be created by not being together. So there is no substitute for physical connection. None at all. There isn't. Mm. You know, it is powerful. It is amazing. But what I have been surprised about is the level of intimacy that can be created when we when we are remote from each other. Mm. And it isn't because of the technology is not the problem. It's how we use it or it's how our, our mindset uses it. And so... Um, I think about, you know, in our team too. So when it first happened, we, you know, we had an office, we don't go to it anymore, but we checked in with each other far more regularly, but far deeper and faster. And if anything, we've seen an increase in productivity because people feel more seen and heard. So they actually want to contribute more to the organisation. And when I'm working with other organisations and they've made a commitment to actually be more connected in their um just in terms of knowing each other and seeing each other, their productivity has also risen exponentially and they don't quite understand it because it's this kind of esoteric soft skill kind of thing that they go, well, how do you put a price on it? But people are all feeling much more proud of being with each other and working for organisations that actually value them as a human, not the work that they do. So mm. that's, that's really what I'm quite surprised about. I didn't think it could be so powerful. It, it's an interesting one. I, yeah, on reflection, I probably define myself by my two purposes in life before. So one of my purposes was work, right? I, I have this role, this persona, this stages, this presentations, this audiences, uh, and that was very much a, a core part of my life. But the other purpose that I've had for the last few years, for the last six years, uh, with my older sister had been diagnosed with cancer. And so I would do regular trips back to the UK because I had a role to play as a brother and an uncle. And, and so those were the two things that drove my purpose. And within two months, both of them disappeared because there's no stages, there's no flights, there's, there's no events. And my sister passed away. And I'm like, ah, oh, I've been driven by this, these two purposes that I never articulated. They're not on a piece of paper. It's nothing to do with productivity. It's just these there were the two things that drove me. And you're like, well, hang on. Now they're gone. What, what, what is my purpose? How do I go about finding that? How long do I give myself to find that? And, and how okay am I with not having a clear purpose? 
because it's it's such an intrinsic motivator for me that defines so much of what I naturally do on a daily basis, whether it be the work I do or the conversations I'd have with my sister. And you're like, cool. Well, now I've not got those. So, so now what happens? Like, where, where's that foundation? And so I've been going through a process of trying to work out how do I redefine what I stand for? What is my identity? You know, what is my role in, in society, family and work? And, and how do I use this opportunity to re- rebuild that? Because when two major foundations go away, there's no point plastering the wall, right? There's no point trying to decorate. You've got to go back to basics, right? And, and find your core values. And that's been a, a fascinating challenge for me in the last few months. And actually, I'm really glad that it's a weird side effect of COVID that I've had so much time to think about it. Whether it be flying back from the UK and doing 14 days in quarantine, or actually when I finish work here in a given day, I can sit on my balcony, have a cuppa and just watch the sunset. That's my time to reflect and go, what am I going to do next? And, 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 and what is the impact of what I have? Whereas I think a lot of people were in autopilot. It's a new year, it's a new week, it's a new month. And we were in this copy, cut and paste. Those incidents for me have made me just go, stop. Stop, like it's time to, this is a blank piece of paper. It's time to start again. And I think that's, it, it's an interesting way to think about what we stand for and the impact we want to have. Great advice, Dom. Love it. And to all of you and for, for Georgia and Dom to open up about your own personal losses, to be able to share that with everyone, I think it's just a really lovely and poignant reminder that you know we all grieve, and and there are people that are watching this that are going through um, harrowing, harrowing experiences, and it's not easy. So I think just the fact that we're able to share our I use the term stuff, and I don't know what stuff is, but. I think it's great just to take off, not the mask, not this mask that we have to wear, but just to be who we are. It's just so much easier. The facade. It? Yeah, you've got to drop mm. the facade. And I think that's what this time will reward is, is you know, when, when Georgia says we have ways of connecting and, and Dylan, you touched on this with family, right? It's like, yes, we might not be able to physically hug, but when you, when you open up a bit of you inside and, and share with that authentic, vulnerable fashion, and it's like, it's not a pity party of who's got the, you know, the worst backstory. It's just going, hey, here's some stuff, and it is stuff. Here's some stuff I've got going on, and here's some good stuff. Like, I feel really privileged in my life right now, and here's some bad stuff, and then that off, and I'm okay, right? I'm okay, but there's some pluses and minuses, and, and I think we've had a habit in the past of just talking about the pluses, and now the time for us to go, actually, let's just balance the conversation, right? Because we are all rounded human beings with some terrible stuff that happened and some awesome stuff, and actually, I think finding the balance is, mm. is where the beautiful conversation can happen. Mm. I, um, I've seen a lot of people struggle with their identity in the last five months, a lot. And even in my network, which is, so I've got my own consulting business, you know, within, by early Feb, hundreds of us, and I know those people all had their calendars cancelled. So, you know, years ahead, we was like, we just, we've just got no work. And, and that's a whole conversation in itself, but there was a lot of the similarities that I saw was with people not just struggling with the financials, but who am I if I'm not delivering? Who am I if I'm not, you know, doing a keynote? Who am I if I'm not running a team? Who am I? And I actually think this is one of the things that COVID is our gift for, if we want to try and find a lesson, which is when you strip away the gold medals, when you strip away being amazing in front of people, when you strip away having a director in your title or, you know, running a project or being on TV, who are you? And I think getting back to that purpose of who am I, who, I, who am I, how am I meant to show up for myself and others is actually one of the beautiful gifts from this experience because mm. when we can create that interconnectedness, which is not a title, not a what I do, but how I be, I reckon that's when we start nailing how to do humanity and how to do life and how to do work and how to do teams, which is we, we connect through our vulnerability, not through our walls, mm. not through yes. our masks. And if we can't do it now, you know, like I'm having a meeting with a guy last week and he's, in, he's on the toilet. Like he's literally not, the lid's down. 
but he's on the toilet because the only room that he can get peace at the moment is actually in the bathroom. Yeah. And he was a bit embarrassed. I'm like, no, this is, we just got to be real. And like, th this is how we roll these days. And it's, it, it, it's, it's getting us on an even path and it's whether we choose to bite that and actually really, you know, be real. The, the one thing I've, I've challenged there, G, is, is, is we're doing a research study right now. And one of the things that came out is organizations aren't moving quickly enough to appreciate changes of identity. So this one lady told mm. a story in our research project and she said, I had two identities before. Um, at, at nighttime and at weekends, I'm a mum. I'm a parent, I'm a wife, and I'm a mum. And I'm brilliant at it. And then, and then I put on this superhero outfit in the morning and I drive to this other place and I'm professional and I do all these other things. And she's like, and then since February, I've been crap at both of them. She's like, I feel like a terrible parent and a terrible professional. So I'll be in the middle of a meeting and one of the kids will do something and I can't finish the meeting, I have to go and deal with the kids. And then I'll be dealing with the kids and then I'll need to do something work. And they're like, mommy, you're, you're here. Why aren't you playing with us? Right? And she's like, so, so her identity, the blurring of those lines for her, whilst for a lot of people they talk about flexibility and, and you know, I can build my own week and all the good stuff. She's like, I've lost my identity and I feel really mediocre at both things. And so I think there's an onus on leadership and, and organizations to say, how can we help you navigate through that? Because mm. people who lose their identity, lose their motivation, their sense of self-worth, right? And, and that's a whole sort of myriad of, of other health problems. Sorry, Dylan, I cut you off. Oh, no, I was just going to say how powerful it is to hear two extremely successful people talk about that. You know what I mean? That, that you're going through it as well. Um, I think so many people think that obviously they see when they turn on the news and everything like that, that everybody's going through this. But when you really drill down to where people think internally, am I the only person that has no purpose? Am I the only person that is feeling this? Am I the only person that isn't sure about what's going to happen next? And um, mm. if you take, you know, strip back, as you said, all our titles and everything that we do, it comes down to the, the person that you are and what you believe in and what you want to do. And everybody's feeling that. And it's a conversation everybody has to have with themselves. You know what I mean? And, and I guess get permission to have that conversation because yes. it's super powerful. And hopefully things like this helps. You know what I mean? I know it's helping me just this thing and, and it will permeate through more people. And, and I guess also for people that don't see things like this, pass that message on. You know what I mean? Talk about your experience. Talk about how you're feeling and the path that you went because that'll help other people feel like they can do it too. On that, I mean, how are you going with your purpose and identity? Because for so many of us, tennis is where we see you. And temporarily, it's been taken away from you in that competitive aspect. That's a big life change. Yeah, it is. I mean, I have known this for a while, but it was great to put pen to paper that people think my purpose is winning Grand Slams and gold medals. Um, but I could win 25 Grand Slams and, and 10 gold medals. and and it actually isn't my purpose why I get out of bed every day. Um, my purpose is to try and help people that are just like me, people from my community with a disability, help them get out and live the lives that they want to live. Help them get out and be the people that they deserve to be and get mm. the opportunities that they deserve. Um, I've always known that's my purpose, but to actually put it out there and realize that's what my purpose was, mm. was really powerful for me. Um, and although that's why I like winning tennis tournaments because it gives me the platform to do what I'm passionate about, which mm. is try and, you know, try and break down barriers and change perceptions and, and eliminate stigmas for people that are like me. And um, so in saying that, I, my purpose was taken away from me a bit because I didn't have that stage to do keynotes. I wasn't in the media. I didn't mm. get that opportunity to go with Wimbledon where I could do a great speech and talk about what was important to me. And, and that affected me, it really did. But it was all about finding other ways to contribute and other ways to do things that were important to me. Um, and in order to do that, um, I did some, some work online through some support worker websites, um, one in particular called Mabel, where I went online undercover and talked to people with a disability via conversations like this, how they were handling their lives and things like that. And it was probably one of the most rewarding things I did through this period because it may, I actually learned more off them than they learned off me, to be honest, mate. I really did. The way that they were handling their current situation and things like this. And, and, it's, you know, listening to Georgia and Dom, it's so pivotal to remind yourself of what your purpose is. Because as soon as I did that, and I stopped sucking about not being able to go to the Paralympics, I immediately felt better. Because yeah. I remembered what my true purpose was in being here. 
And, and, you know, as soon as I started being me again and not worried about, you know, hitting tennis balls, but more so worried about what I really enjoyed doing every single day with my life, mate, it, it changed my mindset straight away. Fabulous. Fabulous. Can I just check? you, Dylan. He's a yeah. big hug. Yeah, Good. fabulous. Can I just go back to when you were doing that counselling? So it was incognito, was it? They didn't know it was you? Yeah, they, no, they didn't know they were going to speak to me. So I didn't want them to be like, oh, my God, I'm talking to Dylan Alcott. I just, if they knew <laughs> I was. It was just like, I just literally, they said, oh, we've got a support worker who wants to check in. And they said, no worries. And then they opened the call and it was me. It was awesome. I played battleships with one girl online. She <laughs> kicked my ass. Kicked my ass. God, I was bad at that. Um, I talked to a guy who, uh, who wants to, he has autism. And he wanted to get into podcasting. So we talked about that. It was so cool. It was so cool. And um, it was just like, you know what? That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to talk to people who are like me, who might hate themselves because of their disability, like I did, who might not be given the opportunities. And, and I understand I'm in a privileged position. I'm the most lucky person that I've ever met. I love my life so much. And people with a disability might see me on TV and be like, oh, yeah, but I can't be like that guy. But if you take away the fact that I'm lucky enough to be a Paralympian and work on TV, I'm just someone with a disability who used to also hate who I was. And I just want to try in even the smallest way to yeah. help them be proud of who they are. Cause yeah. you know, as soon as I was proud of who I was, my life changed immediately and it's silver linings, you know, the pandemic sucks. I'm not going to say it doesn't, but there are, you find little things every day where you realize that that was actually, you know, there is a silver lining in all this and, and I'm just trying to see the positive aspects of those things. And it, might, it might be worth like, the, so there's a few things that, that Dylan teased out there. I, I was very fortunate a couple of years ago, uh, a wonderful lady who mentors me, uh, I was in New York visiting her and she gave me an exercise. Uh, and I think it's an exercise we can give to all the listeners for free, right? To, to help them live. If they're struggling with purpose or identity, to help them do it. It's called the four L's. Uh, what, did I, what do I love? What do I long for? What do I loathe? And what, what have I learned? But you do it on yourself. I do it as a leader every quarter. I reflect back on the previous 90 days. What have I loved about myself? And I hate that bit. I'm like, oh, no, I'm like, no, own it. It's probably your superpower. I'm not saying get on a soapbox and beat your chest. Just like own the thing that you love about yourself, right? Dylan's owned his thing. You're like, brilliant. What have you longed for, right? And you're not allowed to add in the longed for until you take out the loathed. Because we're all full. Cognitive, we're all full. We have no space. So stop trying to add stuff in until you take something out. And then the learn is, what's the thing I experimented with last quarter? Whether it worked or not doesn't matter. What did I learn from it? And I go and tell as many people as possible, right? And then they tell me back that like, they're four L's. And, and once I first did this, I'm like, oh my God, I've just created peer-to-peer -peer learning network free of charge, right? All it takes is for me to park my ego at the door, delete my rational brain and have an honest conversation with myself, which is normally it takes the wine in the background to do. But I'm like, what do I love, long for, loathe and learn? I do the exercise, I share it with others. That's me being vulnerable because it's honest. They share back. And, and I think it was Dylan mentioned before, like finding the person who's good at something. When I, when I long for something and I would tell people like, oh, I'm really good at that. Can I help? I'm like, yes, I'm not going to learn it from a book. I, I want to learn that from a person. And so that exercise has helped me evolve every single day and every single week and every single quarter by making sure I delete the baggage that I'm carrying. And I think right now with the changes we're going through, if we can't find a way of unlearning the old habits and rituals, we'll never have the time to learn the new ones. Um, a, a friend of all of ours gave me a book last year or the year before, The Mask of Masculinity by Lewis Howes. And one of the key takeaways that, and I know a lot of people are, this is their world now, is that know-it-all mask. I always felt like I had to have an answer for everything so now I find one of the most empowering things is when somebody asks me something, I smile and I say, I don't know. I don't know. And I invite them to, to give me the answer, to pass on the knowledge, because I really want to know what they've got to say. And I'll, I'll acknowledge that for maybe the previous few decades, I was not good at that. But acknowledging that has just been a big step about that. Yeah, I, I, got, I got a slap about the face on, on a, a similar theme a few years ago. I was, I was in uh, Austin for South by Southwest. Had the pleasure of meeting Dan Pink, who's a hero of mine. I'm sharing these challenges I've got because I want his wisdom and his advice. And he just stared me straight in the eyes. He's like, Dom, argue like you're right and listen like you're wrong. I'm like, yeah, but, but I'm like, oh, no, I think I argue like I'm right and I listen like I'm right. And he's like, yeah, that's the problem. Listen like you're wrong. And don't listen with the intent to correct or butt in, or just listen. 
just take it in. And, and it was this realization that I did the reflection of meetings where I'm like, I would leave meetings going, that was an awesome meeting. Cause I didn't hear the thing that no one said. Right? And, and so I'm like, how can I, how can I listen like I'm wrong? And, and that was a muscle I've had to build over time. And it wasn't natural for me to build. I, I'm a very confident alpha extrovert. And so it's, it was hard for me to do, but it's been very powerful. Like the value I've got from that, from I genuinely listening like I'm wrong has been huge. I don't learn by speaking. I, I learned by the events I attend and the people I listen to, listen to Dylan, Gerard before you, Brad, George, like I'm learning more from that than I am from here. Because my own thoughts, I, I knew them beforehand. It's very rare that I come out with a bit of genius where I'm like, wow, that's awesome, right? But it's it's listening, it, but it's just absorbing. It's not mm -hmm. judging it, it's just taking it in and going, whether I liked it or not, doesn't it doesn't matter. I just need to take it in and let it sit there for a while. People really struggle to be present and listen to what's going on because they have these I should stories all in their head all the time. Mm. Oh, I should have listened. I should have been like that. I should have taken, I should have made that better decision. I shouldn't have done. And what stops us from listening a lot of the time is the judgment that, you, that, that Dom's talking about. So it's the judgment of self or the judgment of others. And so until we actually learn to start dropping some of that, it's, it's, it's hard for us to truly listen. Uh, Dom, I touched on it earlier. You don't have any issue being in an uncertain environment as long as, and you take it away. As long as you build confidence over time, right? I, I, I've, you know, one of the things that Atlassian's taught me in the seven years I've been there so far is, is there's so many things we don't know. And actually the more we try and work them out, the slower we get. So it's like, okay, we've just got to accept there's unknowns out there. That creates inherent uncertainty, which a lot of leaders panic about. They're like, no, we need a plan. I need to know what day is that going to be delivered on you? Like, I, I honestly don't know. Like, it will get delivered on a day. I just can't tell you with certainty. What I can do, though, is if I start doing something, if I reflect on regular intervals, I will get more confidence as I deliver more milestones. I will learn more. I'll learn more about the scope, the customer I'm delivering it to, the nature of the thing that I'm trying to deliver. I get more confidence over the time. Now, sometimes that confidence drops. Because I learned something, I'm like, oh, we're now further away. Like, we've spent another week, but the thing that we've learned is we're going in the wrong direction. But that's good. We only spent a week doing that. Now we're going to go in a different direction, and I'm going to learn more. And so what we reward people for is navigating through that uncertainty and, and building confidence over time by saying, what's my mission this week? What have I learned? What's a good milestone? What can I reflect on? What can I do better next week? And we do that as a team. Because the diversity of the team view, the, the fact that everyone sees the world through a different lens, that gives us a, a, a valuable set of insights. Because this idea of perfection, it kills innovation, it kills curiosity, and it kills just a lot of people's mojo, right? Because it's such a high bar that you're never going to achieve that it's thankless. And so confidence for us over time gives us more agility and more nimbleness, which rewards our staff, right? It lets them use their brain and their heart to guide themselves, and it rewards our customers because it means our products will always be better. Dom, you and the company, it's one of the most successful companies in Australia and it's so refreshing to hear, yeah, we don't have all the answers. You know what I mean? So, so many people out there would look external like 100%, they got the answers, it's got to be them. You know what I mean? And it's, I always use the example where by, if there's somebody working within a workplace, say with someone with a disability, when they've got a question with a disability, the whole office goes and looks at their per that person, like they got the answer. Yeah. Right, and then that person yeah. feels pressure to go, oh my god, and they make up the answer, or they or they pretend like they know the answer, and it's so refreshing and it's so true to be able to go, you know what, I don't know the answer, but let's work it together to figure out the answer and have the confidence that we can do so. Um, I think it's so important to be able to show that that you don't have to know everything all the time as long as you work as a cohesive unit to figure out the best way to move forward. You know, within an organisation, it might be within your family, within the current landscape, within the community. You know, it permeates across every every basket. To all of you, do we need to just cut ourselves a bit of slack? And I'm talking to everybody watching this. There was some of you may have seen it a few months ago. I saw something on social media, and it was from the forestry department in Canada, of all things. And basically, they had a directive, and it spelled out working remotely because it was foreign to all of them. And it said, "Now you're not working from home. You are." doing your best to get work done at home while juggling all of your other roles and tasks and saying to yourself, okay, I've got the answer to this. It's to, to get everything done and be a partner and a mother 
and do everything that we need to do around our family? I know the answer. I will work till two or three o'clock in the morning so that I will get everything done. But that's not the answer and that's not sustainable, is it? Yeah, far, far from it. But it's also, I, I think the reality, and, and you know, Georgia talked to the, this before with the word productivity, is this this bizarre fetish we've got with productivity whereby people have, I even heard a comment the other day where someone said, you know, I'm saving my commute time so I can reinvest that in work to be more productive. I'm like, no, no, that commute time was yours. Use it to grow or listen to a podcast or do Pilates. No, Don't no. use it to work. Don't extend the work day. Like those habits creep in because people are nervous about, you know, what if, what if Joe in finance is working a bit longer and I get left behind and I get made redundant or something happens. And, and so the fear of, of not opening up, the fear of not being vulnerable or all the fear of what could happen, the recourse, is actually prompting us to do some pretty crazy stuff right now, which is definitely not sustainable and just leads to burnout. So I think that's why that, that conversation needs to elevate of going, what, what is the stack rank? Right? I, I need you to survive as a human. I need you to be a great member of your family. I need you to be a great member of society and, and then work. Right? And actually we often do it the other way around. And so I was, I was fortunate years ago to work with a, a great organizational professor. And he said, we, we, don't, we don't own people as assets. They're not resources. We borrow them from their family for eight hours a day, and our job is to return them in a better state than we took them in. And I was like, ah, I like that reframe. Like, you, you, it's, you're not a resource. I'm not deploying you for eight hours a day. You're not a machine, you're a human. And, and that's, that's the mindset shift that we need. I just want to finish with a word that we touched on earlier, and clearly it's resonating with so many people now. Trust, we just have to trust now, don't we? Yeah, I think I think I, I like George's point on, on trust. Like we've got to trust ourselves first before we can expect it from others. Like if, and if you've not got that belief in there, if you don't trust yourself, it's a really hard thing to get from someone else. So I think it's like like know yourself and, and trust you know, have have conviction in your own actions and role modeling and, and then I think it will reciprocate. It's a it's a first mover deal. I mean, tr trust is similar to faith, right? Which is the belief in things unseen. So you only really need to have trust when you can't see something. Mm. So, but I actually feel like if we replace that word to surrender, that it's actually more of a helpful thing to mm. be able to do and surrender to what is, surrender to the lessons, surrender to the situation, because when we don't do that, we create drama. Mm. And that doesn't serve us and it doesn't serve the world around us. So, you know, that's that's kind of the thing that's getting me going at the moment. So you surrender to who knows financially what things are going to look like. You surrender to, you know, I, I don't know how long we're going to be in this situation, but fighting it isn't working. It isn't working for me. So I, I'm finding that a little bit even more helpful to, to play with as a word. Well said. Uh, guys, it's been terrific. Uh, we could talk forever, but we will pause and we'll wrap things up in just a moment. Thank you, everyone. It's just been great of all of you to share a big part of yourselves because we all know that it just encourages and gives other people confidence, which we've spoken about, to do the same thing. I gather you've all got something out of our chat? Yeah, I think the received um, recurring theme that keeps coming is you know, prioritizing your well-being in any way that you can, you know what I mean? Because then you can really trust what's going on. As George said, surrender, but most importantly, embrace the situation that we're in and be the best version of you in whatever that is, you know what I mean? And it's going to be a an up and down ride as it continues to be. Um, and I mean, I just feel better talking about it. I've got to go play tennis right now. I'm going to hit tennis balls amazingly well, I reckon. Mm. I'm in a good mood, but um, I, I can't thank Dom and George enough, especially you know, hearing people that are so successful be so vulnerable and say that they're also going through things that everybody's going through. I think it's such a powerful message. And, and I really appreciate, you know, being involved in the project. Fabulous. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, Dylan. It has been fantastic. And to those of you that have been watching, we trust you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much for joining us on the Wellbeing Conversation. Hey everyone, Dylan Alcott again. Now we touched on a few topics around mental health throughout that chat. Now if that brought up anything for you, make sure you reach out to beyondblue.org.au or their phone number is 1300 224636. You can also hit up Lifeline on 13 11 14 or reach out to the people within your ANZ teams and they'll be able to help. 
And here's a little taste on what's coming up on the next episode of the Wellbeing Conversation. Fear's a thief of your of your um, well-being and your joy. They're in a small house or a small apartment, so they've been working off an ironing board. Look, I used to fear a lot when I was was growing up with my disability. Um, I think that was one of the main reasons why it kind of ruined my life, to be honest. And one of the fears for us is, does this go for two years? Will, will they ever find a vaccine? When we allow that to be just a currency that we operate with and allow it to be laced with this idea of not being good enough as a human being, that's where it goes wrong. As soon as you released that emotional baggage and started talking about it, my life honestly changed um, immediately. You can author your own story rather than wait for the news channel to tell you what's next. Mm -hmm.